let's um kick off, shall we? I might ask Janice to um start our session tonight with a karakia. Kia ora, Janice. Oh, kia ora. Inoi tātou. Whakatakataho ki te uri, whakatakataho ki te taonga. Kia mā kina kina ki a uta, kia mā tara tara ki kai. E hi ati ana te atakora hi tioi. E hoka he hauhu. Haumi e ha hui e taiki. Kia ora. Kia ora, Janice. And um, welcome everyone to our vaccination special PSA live event. Um, Kia ora, I'm Benedict Ferguson, your PSA president, and I'm going to do a bit of the introductions and then a wrap up at the end. I'll just first um, introduce who you can all see around the room. Um, first of all, I just want to introduce Dr. Susie Wiles, microbiologist, science commentator and associate professor at the University of Auckland and general go-to person for all things COVID related. Kia ora, Susie. Cool. Uh, next on my list, we've got uh, our National Secretary, Kerry Davies. Kia ora, Kerry, coming in from Wellington. Uh, and then we've got our, what have we got, our PSA special person who is our health and safety guru, Tracy Klenner. <laughs> Kia ora, Tracy. And Andrea from who will be emceeing the session shortly, and also Janice Panaho, our kaihatu from the PSA. So kia ora to you all. Thanks for um, taking the time out um, of all your busy schedules to run this event tonight. Um, lots of questions have come through for members, so we'll rip into those shortly. First of all, I'm going to hand over to uh, Kerry Davies to run through a bit of a big picture view on COVID vaccine and what that means for us workers and members of the union. So over to you, Kerry. Thanks, Benedict. Uh, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, firstly, I want to start off by acknowledging PSA members here tonight undertaking essential services during this pandemic. PSA members are working in, in the community, as um, a number of you are, delivering home support services, working in DHBs, laboratories, on the border and in M M MIQ facilities. You're also delivering wage subsidies and business support as well as the critical social support needed to New Zealanders during this time. As we all know, um, we're now dealing with the COVID variant of, um, the Delta variant of COVID, which is extremely contagious. The government's elimination strategy is working and we are following science and a strong public health approach. I want to, want to acknowledge the many PSA members providing good science and public health advice to our government. The PSA backs our members and supports the expertise of our members making a huge difference for us all. A key part of that is our vaccination program. You have a right to get a vaccination and your employer should be doing everything possible to enable you to do so, including time and work hours to get a vaccination. Different workplaces and people will all have different situations to deal with and having good processes agreed with you and your union and your employer is very important to ensure everyone's rights are respected. This means proper risk assessment and protections at work. Good information about vaccinations is critical and I want to particularly thank Dr Wiles for joining us here tonight to share your expertise. Thank you. Just take myself off mute. Um, thanks for that, Kerry. I'm now going to hand over to Andrea for this session. Um, over to you, Andrea, to facilitate the next sort of 40 odd minutes. Um, thank you. Fantastic. Kia ora, everyone. My name is Andrea, as some of you will know from our webinars last year, and also from me, a very warm welcome to you all. Great to have you on board. Um, the next uh, round about 40 minutes or so, we will um, hear from Tracy Klenner first. She will give us a bit of a summary of how the union has been involved so far in the COVID response and uh, has managed some of the challenges that came with that. So that will be around about five minutes. Then uh, Dr. Susie Wilds will talk to us. Um, she will talk for about 10 minutes to give us a bit of an overview of um, the signs on vaccination, but also some myth um, busting. So watch this space. And after that, we'll have 25 minutes roundabout um, for question and answers. We have received many questions 
via Facebook, via email. So uh, we will ask a lot of those. But um, if you have questions during the webinar, of course, um, please ask them via Facebook and we will get um, back to you. So first of all, Tracy, Tracy Klenner, um, please come forward and um, give us a bit of an overview of how the union has been involved in the COVID response. Thank Good you. Andrea, and kia ora PSA whana. It's lovely to have everybody here. So um, as most of you all know, working in this space, COVID-19 is one of the biggest health and safety issues for workers that we've faced in recent times. The PSA and affiliate unions have been working tirelessly to ensure that members have access to vaccinations, appropriate health and safety protocols in the workplace, and all required personal protective equipment and fair and consistent employment practices. We've been listening to the issues that workers are facing across all of our workplaces, and we've spent countless hours working with ministers across the CTU, the Ministry of Health, WorkSafe, and the Ministry for Business, Innovation and Employment to ensure that health and employment guidance is clear and to, un and to ensure that workplaces are as safe as they can possibly be for all workers. We've worked uh, across the unions to support standing up the managed isolation and quarantine facilities and delivered one of the largest health and safety multi-employer worker participation agreements to make sure that those workers are safe while undertaking some of the highest risk work in New Zealand. We've supported these workers and workers across the borders covered by the vaccination order to ensure that those who are unable to be vaccinated can be placed into alternative work. With the increased risk um, to workers from the Delta variant, We've engaged stakeholders across the sectors to ensure that employers are taking this very seriously. We have an, intern an internal pandemic response team to ensure we are raising members' concerns to the highest levels of government and making sure that we have up-to-date communication and information readily available for you all. The PSA is here to support members, to work with you all to resolve matters in your workplace, and we have a team of workers too who are available to assist you all. Please ensure that you contact the PSA as soon as possible if you hear of any of your employers undertaking risk assessments about compulsory vaccination. They need to be done jointly with the involvement of workers in the union and agreements made together before decisions are undertaken. Uh, unless you work in the border or the MIQ space, you do not have to disclose your vaccination status to the employer, clients or customers. That's a question we um, hear a lot from the workers at the PSA. The personal protective equipment and safe distancing in the workplace is the responsibility of your employer. So make sure you let us know if you feel unsafe at work in any way. We're all here to help. Whatever the case, getting vaccinated, if you are able to, will help protect you in your workplace and protect your whanau and the wider community. Kia ora. Thank you so much, uh, Tracy, for the overview. That was great. It might be worthwhile mentioning that if you have any sector specific queries, you should be directing them to your organizer or also now leave some comments on Facebook and we will direct them to the relevant people and get back to you. So thank you so much. Dr. Wilds, your turn. We are very excited to hear from you. And um, yeah, if you would like to take the floor now, um, a good 10 minutes um, for your overview, and um, then we'll get into some questions. Uh, can I just start by saying thank you so much for the invitation to, um, to do the session today. And I just want to say a massive heartfelt thanks from me for all of your members, for everything that they're doing, um, you know, for putting themselves in harm's way, essentially, to keep the rest of us safe. So I can't tell you how much I appreciate your efforts. I know that this is not an easy, you know, an easy job that you're doing, but um, you definitely have my um, my gratitude. And I'm going to get a bit teary, so I'll try not to. Anyway, okay, so COVID-19. Um, this sort of in 10 minutes, I thought there was um, two really, really important things that I wanted to, or maybe three things. Let's see if I can do three things in 10 minutes. Um, three really important things that I want to talk about. So the first is, um, is, is the Delta variant and how it came about. So the really important thing from being people to remember is that um, this virus likes to turn your cells into virus producing factories. Um, and then the first thing it does once it uh, turns that cell into a factory is to make more copies of, uh, of itself, the virus. And the first thing it does for, to do that is to basically make copies of its genetic material. 
And so this virus actually has a, as a way of doing that really, really well. Um, but sometimes just by sheer chance, mistakes will be made when it makes that copy. Um, and this is essentially how we get variants arising. So most of the time, those mistakes will um, be, be nothing. They're just um, little mistakes, but they have no impact. And actually, they're really, really useful for us because they allow us to basically track how the virus is changing and who infected who. Sometimes those changes will actually be bad news for the virus. In that case, the virus will die out in that particular host. Um, but occasionally, um, the virus will basically make a change that gives it an advantage. Um, and then that will be the virus that basically um, goes on to infect others. And so the advantages that we see are basically advantages um, at the moment in um, how infectious the virus is, and potentially also in, um, in making people ill. So we're definitely seeing with the Delta variant, uh, more people hospitalized, uh, but we are seeing a big spike in the number of people who are basically secondary cases. So what we know now is that people are probably about a th thousand times or have about a thousand times more virus in their uh, in their swabs um, when they first test positive and they're testing positive much more quickly. So it used to be about six days was the average when people would test positive. Now it's more like three or four. So what this tells us basically is that those changes um, that are happening by sheer chance, basically because there are so many people infected around the world, you know, we have more of this chance thing happening and then we're seeing now these advantages accumulate that basically allow this virus to, um, to evolve. So the point is that if we don't stop transmission between humans, this will keep happening. Um, and so the question will be, I guess, how much worse is Delta going to get? What other changes might happen? It could be that changes happen that allow the virus to still transmit, but some other thing, like it becomes less deadly, but that is not at all a given. So um, it could get worse uh, or it could just stay the same, but become more infectious. So that, that's important to understand that, I guess, because when we, um, when we think about vaccines in the future, we may well end up needing vaccines um, against a slightly different version of the virus. So this is the um, fact that countries around the world are doing genome sequencing is allowing us to see what changes are happening. Uh, and then if there are changes in the spike protein that mean our antibodies won't work anymore, that's when we'll potentially need to do um, new versions of the vaccine. Okay, so moving on to vaccines really quickly. Um, the thing I want to, uh, I guess, explain is why we've had vaccines so fast. So you'd hear most scientists talking about how it can take five to 15 years to get a medicine from, uh, from our labs um, into humans. But in, in COVID-19 with this vaccine, it was done in a year. So how could that be? I guess under normal circumstances, basically what happens is um, there are three phases of trials. So the first phase one trials are carried out in a very small number of people and they look at um, safety and dosage. Then when they're finished, we move on to say, um, phase two trials, which are carried out on a, on a larger group of people and look a little bit more about safety. And then phase three are carried out on more people and are all about, does this actually work? So what normally happens is those processes happen, those trials happen one after the other, usually with really large gaps in the middle while everybody argues about who's gonna pay for the next phase because they're very expensive. At the end of all that, then all of that data is gathered up together and it's given to the regulators and then they take their time to go over it all to decide whether or not to approve that particular medicine for use in humans. Then if something is approved, uh, the companies will go about starting to manufacture it because obviously there's no point manufacturing something if it's not gonna be approved because then it's a big waste of money. And then at the end of that, they will start um, supplying it to people. So I just know if my door is opening. I imagine this is gonna be a cat coming in a minute. <laughs> um, okay, so what was different about COVID-19? So the big thing that was different was um, countries around the world put in governments, put in huge amounts of money um, so that nobody was arguing about who was going to pay for anything. The other thing they did was that they um, started, so started the phase one trials. And um, as soon as things looked safe enough and that there was a, um, a good dose that, that um, looked safe, they started the phase two trials. So essentially what they did was they were carrying out the, the trials staggered, but kind of um, running alongside each other. So as soon as the phase two trials were looking like the data was good enough, they would then start the phase 
phase three trials. Um, and then basically alongside all of that, they were giving all of the data to the regulators um, so that they had it and they could evaluate it as it was going on. At the same time, they started manufacturing the vaccines. And that meant that by the end of the phase three trials, when so all of the trials had been done, the regulators had all of the information that they'd been assessing all the way through, the vaccines were already being manufactured, then they could basically, as soon as the regulators decided that the vaccines were looking safe enough to give to people and effective enough, then they could basically start um, rolling them out. And it just shows that with basically enough money, you can shorten that period from 10 to 15 years down to about uh, 12 to 18 months, which I think is just amazing. Um, and I really hope that we would do the same thing for some of the other diseases that you know we need medicines for. Okay, in my last few minutes, I want to talk about a really, really important thing. Um, and that is um, that we are surrounded by information about the virus and about the pandemic and vaccines. And a lot of that information will be false. So a really interesting study was done earlier on in this year where they looked at um, social media over a particular time period. They got all of the, the um, tweets and Facebook posts and various other things about uh, the pandemic, about the virus and about vaccines. And then they had a whole bunch of experts go through them to say what was fake, what was false information and what was true information. And they found that of all the, so there was a lot a lot of false information. Um, and that's because actually, you know, that's all saying about, you know, a lie can travel all around the world before the uh, truth has even got its pants on. That's exactly what happened. So there was a lot of false information. But more interestingly, it was something like two thirds or three quarters of that information, they could um, track back to just 12 social media accounts in the USA. So there are a group of people, we call them the um, disinformation dozen um, in the US who are creating fake information about the pandemic and about vaccines now. Um, and they're doing it because this is basically what they do to make money. So they have um, for a long time, way before the pandemic, they've basically um, created fake information about all sorts of things because they have a bunch of companies um, associated with them that make millions of dollars out of selling uh, books, webinars, and basically fake cures. And so a bit like how everybody pivoted when the pandemic started, they did exactly the same thing and they pivoted to COVID-19. What's been really sad has then basically um, people see that information and they start to share it because it's been designed to be shared. It's designed to make you frightened or to make you angry. And so people share that kind of information. What we've seen also here in New Zealand and around the world is there are people in each country who then take that information from those 12 accounts um, and they repackage it so that it looks, um, looks and feels right for their particular audience. So for us here in New Zealand, we've got groups like um, the Voices for Freedom, Dr. Sam Bailey, there's a new group called the New Zealand Doctors Stand or Speak About Science or something, they're doing the same thing. So there's a whole bunch of people and we, can, we know what they're doing because we can see the lies and trace them all the way back to those 12 accounts. So that's the kind of information that we are basically faced with. We've got all the stuff that's kind of coming at us. And basically the way that social media works is that if you start looking at these um, accounts or posts, the algorithms start feeding you more of it. So it can become really quite easy to fall down the sort of rabbit hole of misinformation without even realizing that you're doing it. Um, so basically, if you see posts that are that are um, focusing on uh, the, the survival rate that basically downplay how serious the pandemic is, you know that's probably not good information. Um, and something that basically focuses on your individual rights is also probably not, probably at some point it's going to start asking you for money or trying to sell you something. Um, I think as union members, it's really, really important to remember that why are we members of a union? Because we have a, you know, we're stronger together. And that's exactly the same for COVID-19. So while we all have the rights to make informed choices about our bodies and about vaccines, we should be making those rights thinking about everybody else around us too. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Dr. Wiles. That was amazing. I think it, it feels a little bit like you gave us a bit of an insight into a whole big different universe, really. And you, you definitely already busted a myth for me. And that was the one about, um, you started with uh, saying that the mistakes that the virus makes produce the variants. I always thought they purposefully 
you know, change so that they can survive. So I had no idea that a mistake leads to these var variants. So that was quite um, insightful. <laughs> Thank you. Um, as I said, we have a, a lot of questions and we also have uh, quite a bit of time. So uh, we can run through them um, and uh, deal with them in quite a bit of detail. And if your cat came in and you want to <laughs> bring her back to wherever she belongs, you can. Because we have the time. There she is. What's her name? Um, uh, um, mischief. Mischief. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> well, I'm sure she is interested in everything you have to say tonight as well. So we'll keep her as part of the audience. Um, maybe we'll start um, about uh, some of the um, questions that relate, um, broadly speaking, to the levels of vaccination. And we got one question about the percentage of the New Zealand population that needs to be vaccinated for herd immunity. Can you give us a little bit more insight into that? Yeah. So... Um... So herd immunity is essentially this idea that once enough of us are vaccinated, um, you know, we can kind of protect everybody. So it's a number that very much depends on the infectiousness of the particular organism and how it spreads. So we've got an airborne virus that is extremely infectious. And that means that that number is going to be very, very, very high. So the modelers um, here have done some modeling and it looks like it's going to be up at sort of 90 odd percent probably um, in order to get that kind of what we call community immunity. I don't like calling it herd immunity. Um, so it's going to be really, really high. And what we have to remember is that number includes our children. So lots of countries at the moment are um, working on a much lower number and a number that really only applies to adults um, and not not children. And so it's basically no country is going to reach that until there is a vaccine approved for children. So the reason there's um, there's no vaccine approved for under 12s yet is because children were not included in the early trials, um, mainly because when the virus first came, you know, it was very clearly um, it had an um, this uh, age structure, right, where the older you were, the more chance you were of having a really serious infection. And it, and it went up exponentially. It was quite, the data is quite astonishing. Mm -hmm. So grown-ups were the focus for the first trials, um, but children have been included in the more recent trials. So under 12s are currently um, enrolled in trials. That data is expected um, towards the end of the year. So hopefully by the end of the year, we'll have um, good data. And it may well be that they get a different vaccine from us. So there are lots and lots of of different vaccines and trials at the moment, probably over 100 or something in the different phases of clinical trials. And one of those is a vaccine called Novavax, which um, is a different, so it's a different technology to the Pfizer one, but it's a one um, that's uh, the kind of vaccine that's very, that's the, using the technology that we normally um, make childhood vaccines out of. So yeah. I imagine if the results from that look really good, that may well be the vaccine that ends up being um, offered to children because it's one that everyone will probably be much more um, happy with giving children given it's a technology that's used in lots of other childhood vaccines. Mm. Um, so all of that is currently underway and I hope that we'll have good data from those trials by the end of the year. Mm, great, very important as well. Do you think there's um, a possibility for a vaccine that can actually counter multiple variants or will it always have to be a new one? You talked about the changes in your introduction and uh, the possible need for um, other or new vaccines going forward. So is there a chance of having like a, a, ki a kill all vaccine, if you like? So that, that is something that um, is being looked at, um, not, not specifically about um, this virus, but about related coronaviruses. So mm -hmm. um, there are hundreds and hundreds of coronaviruses. Um, mm -hmm. Many of them call the, cause the common cold. And then there are three that are cause serious disease in humans. So the original SARS, there's another one called MERS, and then this one that causes COVID-19. And so one of the things that people are looking at is whether you could um, make a vaccine that worked against all of those, basically. Um, mm -hmm. 
it's pro I mean, we the, the same things have been tried for flu for many years. Uh, I don't know how likely it is or whether it would happen in the next five or 10 years. Um, the other thing we don't know is how the virus will change and what, what impact that will have on our antibodies. So when we have the, so the thing that our vaccines are all made against is the spike protein. Um, the spike protein is what the virus uses to attach to cells, but it is also the thing that our immune response recognizes. So that's what we make antibodies to. And if there are changes that happen in that spike protein that mean that our antibodies no longer recognize it, that's kind of what, what we'll need a new um, vaccine reformulating for. Mm -hmm. So there are scientists in the lab who are basically taking that spike protein and making lots of mutations and seeing if they can map which mutations are the ones that mean that our antibodies won't work anymore. And then it could be once they've done that, that they could look at, so what would you, what could you make that would work? But all of this stuff is quite early stage. Um, and so at the moment, it's definitely easier to be monitoring what variants there are using genome sequencing. And then because the mRNA vaccines are so quick to change and make, um, making new um, boosters that would basically work against these variants that, um, that our antibodies don't work against anymore. In the development of those boosters, I imagine they don't take as long as the development as the vaccine as such, right? No, I mean, it should be a fairly easy thing because all you're doing um, is changing the sequence of this um, mRNA. So basically the Pfizer vaccine um, has got a very, very small amount of ingredients. So its main ingredient is essentially the re recipe to make a spike protein. Mm -hmm. And then you wrap that recipe um, inside of little uh, balls of fat. Um, and then you add a little bit of salts, um, and that's just so when you inject it into your arm, it doesn't kill the cells in your arm. Um, it's at the same pH. And then because this little recipe is so fragile, basically we have to store it at low temperatures. And so in order to make the fats okay at low temperatures, we add sugar. So there's very few ingredients. And that way of delivering medicines, in this case, the, um, the vaccine, uh, is one that's been used for years and all sorts of other things. So it's just this one ingredient that changes this recipe, it will be a recipe for a new spike protein. And so there's, there's no reason that it couldn't go through um, uh, trials quite quickly to say whether it actually because what you need to know is do you still make antibodies to that new spike protein, there's nothing to suggest and you know and with those um, antibodies be okay. Um, there's lots of work they can do in the lab looking at what's likely to be made and, and making sure that doesn't cross react with anything in our bodies. So there's loads of stuff that can be done even before they get into people. And so I imagine they're doing all that stuff um, all the time, especially because they can they can make they can make any of these mutants, uh, you know, these different spike proteins, you can make a whole bunch of different things and start testing them in the lab and in animals. And I imagine they're probably doing that so that you could get into, uh, into humans um, as quickly as possible. Fantastic, thank you. You have a wonderful way of explaining something so complex. <laughs> it feels like I can make my own vaccine tonight here in the kitchen, <laughs> but of course we are not encouraging anyone to do that. <laughs> But it's very, it's very clear, and um, I think people can um, actually um, get the gist of what you're saying in such a complex matter. Well, one thing I will, I will quickly say, I'm not sure whether there are any questions on this, but I think it's important to talk about. Mm -hmm. so, um, so a vaccine is basically um, a way of giving your immune system a, a kind of a detailed map of what it is that needs to protect you against. Mm -hmm. And so our, so our immune response after vaccination is exactly the same immune response that you would have normally, it's just a quicker one. So think about um, the job of the virus, as I said, is to turn your cells into virus producing factories. And the job of our body is to go, no, thank you very much, and to try and kill the virus. But the cell it's infected has to tell the body that it's infected first. And this virus is pretty, pretty amazing in that it's got ways to try and stop the cell from doing that. So that's why basically after you get infected, there's a couple of weeks where you kind of it takes time for your body to get um, to get going. Think of your immune response as being like a whole bunch of uh, like the armed forces, I guess. You know how we've got like a Navy and an Army and an Air Force and they all work in like one in the water and one on land and one in the air. Well, our immune system is exactly like that. So we have special cells that work in our blood and we've got special cells that work in our nose and our mouths and various things at different kinds of surfaces. And then in each of those forces, just like in the armed forces, we've got different kinds of soldiers. And so when somebody gets infected, 
And what your body needs to do is to say, hey, bring the right army to the right place and bring all the right soldiers. And that mm -hmm. takes time. What a vaccine does is basically gets the army in the right place with all the right soldiers so that when you get infected, everything's there and can and can happen. So that's why it's really good at protecting us from severe infection. So we know that someone who's vaccinated is much less likely to end up in hospital or end up dying. Mm. But one of the things that's been really disappointing about this vaccine is that it doesn't stop people from getting it completely. So even though they might, they'll be, um, they'll have less symptoms and stuff they unfortunately can still pass it on to someone else. So yeah. the other thing though, is that um, we've, uh, scientists have looked at this and they've found that people who are vaccinated, if they do get infected, are infectious for a much shorter period of time. Mm -hmm. And with Delta, every day counts. So if yeah. you are infectious for a smaller amount of time, then that is, that is much better. So mm -hmm. getting vaccinated is still about basically protecting you from severe infection, but it's also about trying to, if you did get it, spread it to far fewer people. And one of the reasons we think that you can still get it and transmit it is because in the nose is basically a different form of army. I don't know, we can call that one the army um, versus what's in your bloodstream, right? And a vaccine goes in your arm. And mm -hmm. so the vaccine is basically generating one type of army, where, which is a really protective one. And what we really need is, is an army in our nose. And so it may well be that in the next few years, the next generations of vaccines are ones that you actually have up the nose, which will then should stop transmission. So again, all of those, those types of things are still in trials, but are not quite ready yet. But that's one reason why um, it's really disappointing that this vaccine doesn't stop transmission, but it does reduce it. And it certainly protects people from severe infection. Right, thank you. Thank you for clarifying all of that. Um, I would like to talk a little bit now about um, some of the hesitations that some people might have um, before getting vaccinated. And I guess a lot of people are thinking about um, the longer term consequences. If there are any, are there any disadvantages, any risks of getting vaccinated against COVID-19? Yeah, so that's a great question, right? And, and I think it's definitely something that people are concerned about because, you know, people are asking me, well, what are the long-term consequences? And the answer is, well, they've only been used in people for a year, so that's all we can tell you, right? Mm -hmm. But what we can say is that there's highly unlikely to be any. Um, this, the, so I think that people are also worried about the fact that this is a new technology, um, so using these mRNA vaccines. Mm -hmm. But one of the things to, to explain about them, I guess, is that, it's very clever. So they're also using about 30 to 40 years of research in the lab and in animals before they got to humans. So this is not something that just came out of nowhere. It was something that was developed over many years, um, was really kind of accelerated when, uh, when um, SARS and MERS happened. Um, but basically because SARS and SARS was got rid of in like 20 years ago and MERS um, has never really infected that many people, it's quite hard to catch. You basically catch it from camels. And so it hasn't, you know, th there's not been that many cases. So there's never been any money putting into making a vaccine from that in humans. But we've learned a huge amount about the trials done in animals with those kinds of, um, those kinds of vaccines that basically got us to the stage where we are um, today. So we, one of the things about this technology, though, is that it basically uses a process that happens in every single one of our cells every single day. So basically, if our cell wants to make a protein in order to do something, um, it has to take the recipe for that protein and make it. So in our cells, um, the recipe is, is in the form of our DNA, but DNA basically is locked away in the nucleus of our cells. And the little machines that basically turn that recipe into proteins are outside of the nucleus. They're called little ribosomes. Mm -hmm. And so what our cell does is it basically, when it wants to make a protein, it makes a photocopy of the recipe, which is RNA. And then that RNA leaves the nucleus, goes to these little machines and makes the protein. So all we're doing is basically giving that recipe to our cells and saying, please make this protein for us, which they do. So this recipe, this mRNA is really fragile. It doesn't last for very long. It probably only lasts for a few hours or days. It gets, it gets taken up by the cell. The cell makes it in its little ribosomes. And then the cell goes, hang on a minute. This is not a human protein. This is like, it's got things that I don't recognize. 
And so it chops it up and then it basically shows it to the immune system. Uh, mm -hmm. And then that's kind of it. The immune system comes, it clears it all up, but it also makes these memory cells that will remember what that protein was when it sees it again. Mm -hmm. So this is, so as I say, it's using a process that happens in our cells every day. Um, and it's unlikely that it's going to have any um, really severe long-term effects. Normally, when we see side effects from vaccines, they happen in the kind of um, days or weeks or months afterwards. Uh, and so that's why we're kind of seeing some of the things come up now. So um, the things that are really rare take kind of millions of people to see. Um, and with COVID-19, because there are millions, of, well, millions and millions and millions of people infected. And now I think this, I mean, something like 4 billion doses of vaccine of the different vaccines have been delivered around the world. So we're starting to see those rare things. Um, and one of the major ones with the vaccine that we're using is this really rare side effect where in a very small proportion, like really small portion, you know, we've given 3 million doses in New Zealand and we've had one case, um, is this impact on the heart. So it looks like it happens in younger people, um, uh, sort of in their 20s to 30s. Um, and that basically uh, is usually mild, but in the case of this one person, unfortunately, wasn't. And so it's really important that if somebody has um, like chest pains or a racing heart, you know, in the kind of days or weeks after they've been vaccinated, that they immediately go you know, to the emergency room and say, I've been vaccinated. This is what my heart is doing, because if they catch it early enough, they can help um, treat it. So that's mm -hmm. that's one of the one of the only real things. Um, all of the data so far is suggesting that um, they're, they're, they're safe. And I think what we have to balance that not knowing against is what we do know about COVID-19. And it's really clear, even for healthy people, that COVID-19 is really bad. So a number of people who'll be left with, you know, um, symptoms for six months to a year. And this is, this is, you know, and there's some still going like 500 days after they've been infected. It's kind of amazing, really. Um, so we know that that's a real thing. And we know, for example, this heart um, problem that comes with some of the vaccines uh, will happen to far more people um, as a result of infection. So what you have to balance is something that's very rare with the things that actually we do know are, are much more frequent and happen with um, infection. Mm -hmm. So if, if you had a member in your whānau that is hesitant to get vaccinated and you um, were asked for three main points to actually convince them to get vaccinated, <laughs> what would you say? That's a really hard question because it kind of depends why they're hesitant, right? So there are some people who, um, and some communities, you know, who've had like really bad interactions with healthcare or really bad interactions with the government. And so they're rightfully hesitant about things, right? So you kind of have to understand what it is that is the reason behind someone's hesitancy in order to be able to kind of connect with them and try and talk them through that. Um, I think, I mean, okay, I'm going to kind of appeal to us as, as kind of, I mean, I'm not involved in your union, but I'm involved in my own union, you know, that, that this is about a collective response, right, that we do this for each other. And if you've ever heard of that thing that, you know, the tragedy of the commons. So basically, if enough of us, like, it, we can, we can manage a few people not doing something, right, providing most of us do it. But if enough people don't do it, assuming everyone else will do it and protect them, then we reach the stage where basically it doesn't work, right? So we have to balance um, the good that comes from it, protecting each other. But this is one of the, you know, this is this is um, this is one of the protections. It's not a bulletproof one, but it's one that we add as a layer to things like masks and changes in ventilation and all these kinds of things that we layer them all up to try and protect us all. And so, you know, that's that's the we have some really good science. You know, these vaccines are being given, as I say, to billions of people now. Um, there's really good evidence that they work well and that they are way, way better than getting COVID-19. And so this is, you know, what we're trying to move towards is a future where we can leave New Zealand and come back, where we can have people coming here. And that future is not going to happen if we don't have vaccines as part of our response, basically. So we assume now that that person, we convinced that person and the person got vaccinated. 
Um, why do they still need to isolate if they were in contact with a COVID person, for instance? Yeah, so this is basically was infected by COVID. Yeah. Yeah. So this is because the vaccines don't stop transmission, right? I mean, it's that real bugger about basically the yeah. um, that even though you've got a less chance of getting getting infected, you still have a chance. And if you are infected, you have a chance of being of being able to transmit it. So that that is unfortunately there is kind of no shortcut there. Um, mm -hmm. isolating is the best thing and what's really hard is that if you have the vaccine you might also be less uh, likely to have symptoms and so then you may well transmit it without never being able to be picked up as mm -hmm. the cause of someone's infection so it's super important that mm -hmm. if um, you are asked to isolate that you do it because otherwise the virus might move uh, and we won't know where it came from um, and that's kind of where you end up with these scary situations where an outbreak could be quite big before you realize where it's come from. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We also had a few questions around um, pregnancy. And um, I think that's, a, that's an important topic to um, uh, briefly touch on as well. One person asked if they can get the vaccine um, while they are breastfeeding. Is is that okay, or are there any risks? Yeah. Any risks so the baby as well. Yeah. So the um, so there's been a couple of little studies that come out, but basically the so the um, obstetricians and gynecologists around the world, their kind of colleges and things, have come forward and said that pregnant women should basically be vaccinated. And if you're vaccinated in the second or third trimester, um, the antibodies you produce will also go into your baby. Um, and so they will be protected in their first few months of life too. So it's definitely something that is being recommended. In fact, pregnant people are basically in group three, essentially um, for us. So a recommendation that they get um, vaccinated. And that's because it's really, really clear that being pregnant is also a risk factor for very serious COVID-19. And there's some awful stories now going around of basic, basically pregnant women um, having to have C-sections, you know, to deliver the baby and then the woman dies. So it's a very serious infection and vaccinating um, is definitely a way to protect uh, you and your baby. Um, there's been some a few little studies done on women being vaccinated um, after... Uh, so after they delivered um, to have a look at whether I think there was a some people are concerned maybe the vaccine gets transferred in your breast milk and so I was just reading a study yesterday where these women donated well yes basically gave milk <laughs> uh, before and after being vaccinated um, and then they used the very same test that we would um, use here on a nasal swab to see if they could identify the virus and so looking for that genetic material from the vaccine and found nothing at all so um, it's uh, basically completely safe to be vaccinated um, and what will happen if you're vaccinated is then you will make antibodies and those will probably be passed to your baby through your breast milk. So a really protective thing that you're um, giving. In terms of impacts uh, um, of the vaccine on, um, so people are worried, I think, about fertility and stuff. And so there's been some studies now looking at couples who were undergoing IVF at the time that they were vaccinated and comparing them with couples that weren't vaccinated. Um, and no impact at all on successful pregnancies. So nothing looks like there's no issues there. Um, some kind men have donated semen before and after vaccinating, and there's been no impact on, on that at all. And there's been studies done of, of um, ovaries and things and no impact on there. Um, but one of the things that is turning up with COVID-19 um, is uh, so men reporting um, basically um, erectile dysfunction, um, premature ejaculation, or not being able to ejaculate um, for months after infection. So it's quite possible that COVID-19 itself may well impact on fertility, but at the moment there's absolutely no evidence um, and no real way that we think it could happen um, from the vaccines. So everything's looking pretty good on that front. Somebody also asked um, if they should get vaccinated while trying to become pregnant. But from what I hear is that um, she should get vaccinated yeah. now. And it's even good for the baby because the baby will be immediately vaccinated then as well if she will get pregnant. 
Yeah, so the baby will certainly have some of, so we call this passive immunization. So the baby yeah. will have antibodies from the mum for the first few weeks or months. Mm -hmm. um, and then at some stage, those uh, kind of disappear. And that's when the baby would need to be vaccinated. Hopefully by then we will have vaccines for um, babies and younger children. But yeah, certainly from that evidence of the couples undergoing IVF, there was no impact at all. So it would be fine, perfectly safe to do it. And you'd certainly, you'd want to be vaccinated if you were going to, be pregnant um, because we know that COVID-19 is such a risk factor for um, severe COVID um, in pregnancy. Do you think, or can you give us a bit of an indication when a vaccine for younger people under under 10 or under 12 will come out? Is it is that something, it might be a bit of a... Well, a so the trials exercise? are happening at the moment. Trials oh, yeah. are happening at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, they should finish by the end of the year. So I'm hoping early next year, we'd know about that. Um, mm -hmm. certainly the, the, we have a pre-purchase agreement with Novavax, which is the one, um, and obviously with Pfizer and so fi both Pfizer and Novavax are doing trials in children. So, um, I would hope that we would be able to get our hands on those, um, pretty quickly after they were approved. Yeah, great, great. Um, another question, um, that we got deals with, um, transmission and the one and two meter rules. <laughs> And I guess, you know, it depends a little bit on if you're wearing PPE or if you're vaccinated, but can you can you elaborate on that a little bit? Um, is it safe if people only keep a meter distance, for instance, in the workplace or when they're walking in the neighborhood? And what, what would you recommend there? Yeah, so this is a really hard rule because um, with rules like this, people tend to think, Ah, yes, you're safe within this space, but not, you know, after that. And actually, it's kind of um, dependent on the environment. Mm. Um, and it's also a bit of a throwback to um, when we thought this virus was droplet spread. So it was all about basically, if you stayed that far away from someone and they sneezed, all the droplets were dropped to the ground. And so you would be protected. But actually, this is not a droplet spread virus. This is basically airborne. So if you are in an enclosed space, it kind of doesn't matter how far away you are. Um, if there's bad, you know, if there's basically virus in the air uh, and the kind of airflow where it comes to you, then it kind of doesn't matter whether you're two meters apart or one meter apart. Um, you may be, so there have been um, some studies that looked at, um, for example, there was a, an outbreak in a school and um, the, it was certainly the desks closest to the teacher, but also at the end of the class that were the ones where the children got infected. And that's probably to do with airflows. And so basically where, so um, probably more air circulating in the middle of the classroom versus kind of around the edges and stuff. So it's a rule that worries me slightly because um, I don't think there's a hard and fast. I think if you're in an indoor environment, then you're basically sharing air and it doesn't matter how far apart you are. Um, outdoors is a different matter because obviously there's, there's much better airflow outside. <laughs> um, but, you know, if you are outdoors, everybody's unmasked and somebody sneezes or coughs or breathes or whatever um, and a gust of wind basically blows that towards you then it doesn't matter if you're two meters apart right so it's a yeah it's a tricky one because it's certainly probably better to be further away but it's it's not a reason to abandon masks so basically I think masks are you know one of the really masks and vaccines are basically our kind of layers of protection staying a little bit further away from others is fine, but it's not going to be as good a protection as masks or vaccines. Mm, thank you. Um, we also had a question around um, the scenario if everyone or the majority of the world's population was vaccinated, what would happen then? Will, will the virus actually die out or will we all just get mild versions of COVID or what, what is the likely scenario? Because I guess that is a, a, a situation that we are trying to achieve, but what, what will it mean for us? So unfortunately, it's not a situation we're trying to achieve, um, oh. not globally. Mm -hmm. So 75% of the vaccines that have been administered so far have gone to 10 countries. 
So the vast majority of the world is not vaccinated and it's unclear when they're going to get vaccinated because supply is such an issue and it's basically being bought out by rich countries. Mm. So the fact but that in, people in are an focusing, ideal world, sorry, in an ideal world, yeah. that's what we are trying to achieve, right? Yes, but unfortunately yes, yeah. we can't do it without yeah. um, supply of the vaccine being changed. So unfortunately, yeah. um, so countries like right. South Africa and India have been petitioning the World Trade Organization mm. to get the patents um, basically kind of held for a while so that they can start making these vaccines. And unfortunately, that's all been um, kind of turned down. This, so there is a research institute in South Africa that has um, basically been trying to make the mRNA vaccines on their own. And I think they've been quite successful. So it may well be that they can start supplying stuff and they may well even decide if their vaccine works, that they will basically give it to the rest, you know, to the countries that are not being able to get um, access to supplies from Pfizer and other companies. Anyway, so I think that's that's kind of, it's a really important point, right? Because my real worry is that we end up with two worlds. We end up with the vaccinated world and the unvaccinated world. Um, and the problem is that there is no guarantee of protection to the vaccinated world if we just allow this virus to keep circulating in the unvaccinated. And a really good example of this is tuberculosis. So tuberculosis is an airborne lung disease caused by bacteria. It is. Uh, it was like a leading cause of death 100 years ago. Um, and then when antibiotics were discovered in the kind of 40s and 50s, um, it became a treatable disease. And it's a hard disease to treat. It takes like six months with um, four antibiotics, but it is treatable. The problem was that basically rich countries treated everybody and then kind of ignored the rest of the world. And so what's happened over the last sort of 40 years, I guess, is that the virus, sorry, the bacteria has evolved. It's evolved to become drug resistant. And now we're all at risk from an airborne bacteria that causes tuberculosis and that is resistant to drugs because we basically ignored it in parts of the world that didn't have access to drugs. So we should learn that lesson and not do it again. And unfortunately, I worry that we are doing it again. Um, but, you know, what, what I guess moving forward. So what we're left with, I think the reality is it's going to be with us for a while. I mean, we're even seeing those countries that are basically using a vaccine not to try and stop transmission, but as a way to open up. And, and, they're, and they're opening up and, you know, children are not infected, uh, sorry, children are not vaccinated. And so rates of infection in children are rising and more children are being hospitalized. So instead of using this incredible tool to help us cut down on transmission, countries are kind of wasting it and allowing transmission to happen. Um, and so what we're likely to need is, you know, boosters for new versions. Um, and, and I think in New Zealand, we're going to have to make really serious kind of um, decisions about how we treat, you know, the border. What does this mean about people coming in if they could basically still be infectious, um, depending on what kind of level of, of vaccination we have here? One really important point I want to make is that the vaccine is safe and effective, but some people won't mount a good immune response. So there are some people with some... Um, uh, diseases, uh, basically, that means that their immune responses are not great. So one of those is a disease called chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Mm -hmm. um, and so people with chronic lymphocytic leukemia, it's perfectly safe to vaccinate them, but they don't mount a very good immune response. So we, we may well be able to vaccinate everybody in New Zealand, but mm -hmm. we will have people who are essentially unvaccinated because their, their immune response hasn't worked, right? Their vaccine hasn't worked for them. And I think we need to be really careful because in the UK, those people are basically just being thrown under a bus, right? They're just being told, well, you're vaccinated now, so you can go out, but actually they're not protected. And so we have to be really careful, I think, about how we treat this disease long term, mm -hmm. um, because if we allow uncontrolled transmission, you know, if we don't stop it, and there may be, we may have good ways of stopping it once most of us are protected, mm -hmm. but if we don't um, stop outbreaks, uh, we could end up killing those people who are basically vaccinated but not protected from that vaccine. So mm -hmm. this is why many of us are saying we need to treat it like measles rather than treating it like influenza. So we should mm -hmm. still, you know, once we're all vaccinated, if a case comes, we should still basically do contact tracing to try and isolate things and stamp out little outbreaks mm -hmm. rather than just leaving it so that it just sort of circulates around and infects people all the time. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a hard, I mean, it's a hard future ahead of us, I think, really. And I think we have to be realistic about that.
Yeah, it sounds it sounds like viruses of you know all kinds and uh, uh, dimensions will be and impacts actually will be with mm -hmm. us um, in the future. And you already elaborated on a few things on how we can prepare for that. Do you have any closing remarks that you would like to make going forward? Oh, I think you know we're obviously in a really difficult time at the moment, and obviously many of your members are. are or especially, you know, um, kind of caught up in all this. I think we have to remember that. Um, actually, one really interesting thing to point out is that um, we're doing something quite extraordinary here in New Zealand. It's really sad that Australia have basically given up now. Um, and we're going to be one of the few countries in the world that's still pursuing elimination. I still think it's the right thing for us. Um, if we think of that collective response about protecting each other, it is absolutely the right, right thing to do. Because what it does is it gives us options. So it allows us to see what happens with vaccination. It allows us to decide what we want to do for ourselves rather than be coming from a position where things are actually quite bad and you know we, we, we're reducing our options. So you know it's been shown already that it's been good for the economy. And while it's really frustrating for some people that they can't travel or that we have people stuck overseas who want to come home, you know, this this is the reality of, of being under this kind of situation. And, and it reminds me of you know, of like wartime and things where, you know, there are there are people around the world who can't travel or who are, you know, who are in terrible circumstances. And I think many of us have lived a very privileged life and suddenly we're having that privilege taken away and it feels like oppression, right? But it's actually not oppression. Um, so I think we need to remember that and keep in mind that by protecting each other, you know, we can we can do the right thing. Um, and And because we're doing this, countries around the world are looking at us kind of with amazement but also now are actually trying to knock us down and I think that's going to be because for many countries who could have taken a similar path but didn't mm -hmm. you know they're living quite difficult lives and this idea of learning to live with the virus is learning to live with death it's mm -hmm. learning to live with long COVID and all of its impacts and mm -hmm. it is learning to live you know with a, with a level of stress that we actually don't experience right because we've had a very different experience of the pandemic and I think we kind of need to keep that in mind mm -hmm. and really think about looking after each other because as I say taking this path at the moment it's not it doesn't mean we're stuck to it forever but it gives us more options moving forward thank you so very much um I learn so much I, I really like you don't get that from a news article or from <laughs> Uh, politicians talking about the virus or vaccinations or PPE or infection rates. So thank you so much. I'll hand over to uh, Benedict. I think he would like to say a few things as well. And then we'll close with a Karakia by Janice. Thank you so much. Nami. Thanks, Andrea. Um, that's great, Susie. Um, I just want to capture some of the myths, I guess the myths that you busted for me was a bit around the um, the speed that this vaccine came about and that idea that the phase one, phase two trials kind of went concurrently as well as the data being shared with the regulators, that was how it, how it got, got onto the market so quickly versus the traditional way of phase one, look at it, then phase two. So that was really helpful for me because that's what a lot of questions I've had is how could you make a vaccine so quick? Um, couple of points there um, resonated with me and I bet it resonated with a lot of members that stronger numbers and collective responsibility that when we think about what we do it's not about what we do for our own protection it's what we do for our friends family and the wider community and all our actions um, and lastly just your ability to distill um, highly complex information down so that we can all grapple with it and go oh I get that I get that it's been um yeah it's been an eye-opener for me um, just thank you again for taking the time to um spend an hour of your evening with us and our members. It's, I'm sure they've been appreciative. Um, and just one other shout out to, um, I think it was Mischief who made a cameo appearance. That was <laughs> quite quite lovely. So thank you. Um, I'll just do a quick round of thank yous to those that joined us. So thank you, Andrea, for that um, stellar job in emceeing tonight. Um, I can see you're growing in your schools of emceeing, but you're doing a stellar job there. Um, one person I forgot to mention earlier was Erin Palachik, our um, National Secretary, along with Kerry. Oh, and there is Erin right there. <laughs> Come on, Erin. Um, do you have sorry, a fun... like to join you? It's been amazing. Yeah. Cool. Just um, while you're there, Erin, do you have a last word on anything you heard tonight? Oh, no, just this has been amazing too. Cool. Uh, I've learned so much. Dr. Mm. Wales, thank you so much. It's been yeah. You've been generous with your time. And Andrea, you are an absolute star. Thanks. Cool. Um, 
Kia ora, Benedict. Kia ora, Erin. Um, thanks to our colleagues who were here earlier, um, Kerry, and who was on the line, our health and safety expert from PSA. Thank you so much. Um, and lastly, to two people you haven't seen tonight, which is Brendan Lane and Bronte Evanson, who's been working behind the scenes a little tech, making sure this all works for us. So just wanted to acknowledge them. Um, over to you, Andrea, do you have a last word to say there? Yep. Yes, I, I think we actually need to thank all of the participants and the audience tonight as well to come, for coming along and for listening and for taking this um, webinar and everything you learned back into the community and discuss it with your colleagues, with your friends, with your whanau and if you have any further questions, as I said at the beginning, please um, leave them on Facebook and we will get back to you and please share the webinar as well if you enjoyed what you heard. So thank you. Thanks Dennis. for that. Oh, um, kia ora, um, Dr. Susie Wiles. I, I just want to acknowledge it was absolutely amazing. Um, I'd like to take you out to uh, <clears throat> our communities, to Māori and Pacifica, because it's really needed in terms of encouraging them. Um, um, I could wrap you up and actually take you out there to actually introduce you, because I think um, it, they need this more than ever in terms of some of the people that have got real doubts about this virus and about getting vaccinated. And I think you've blown away all the myths. And I'm going to use this information to share with our communities tonight. Um, so thank you again. And I'm going to close our meeting now. And I'd like to thank our team. We do a brilliant job working together. Um, but yeah, so uh, thank you again for coming along. So inoi tato. Ka hiki te tapu, ka wātia ia te ara. Kia tūruki ia te ai marama hui e taiki e. Kia ora. Kia ora. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, and everyone. Stay well. All the best.